now time for questions to the Minister for Health, and we'll start with topical questions. No, 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 yes, two questions. Sorry, the Minister. Yeah, and we'll start with list of questions, Minister of Health, and I call Joanne Bunting. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question one, please. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, on the 23rd of September, my department updated the previously published visiting guidance following a review of the regional alert level. The new guidance revises the principles for visiting, which apply across all healthcare settings during COVID-19 pandemic, and will be reviewed based on evolving evidence. The visiting guidance has been informed by the Department of Health's COVID-19 guidance on ethical advice and support framework, which recognises that some patients will be cared for in contacts where recovery is not expected, and that includes hospitals. Decisions to permit visitors into facilities on a day-to-day -day -day basis will lie with the person in charge. This will be based on a risk assessment and rely on the ability to ensure social distancing and safety of both patient, uh, residents and the visitor. In all circumstances, the intention is that each individual should receive personalised and compassionate care, including an appropriate palliative treatment. The pandemic situation exacerbates difficulty in palliative care situations due to physical distancing regulations that prevent or limit family visiting. However, all effort, efforts should be made to allow at least one family member to be present with their dying relative in all care settings where possible. I recognise that the applications of these measures does not allow the level of visiting or contact or support that we would like to facilitate, but my main priority continues to be the reduction of the risk of COVID-19 transmission across all healthcare settings and prevent further outbreaks as far as possible. Call Joanne Bunting for something. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I am referring, of course, to circumstances in which normally the immediate family would be called in, and the minister will know just how important it is that individual and family members get the opportunity to say their, formal, their final farewells. And in some places, this has been reduced to one person, and in others, it's been reduced to none at all. Um, given that the, it's the ward manager who decides currently, the position is not consistent in individual hospitals, never mind uh, across trusts. So will he urgently move to rectify this most cruel practice, because it's leaving families further scarred, and no one should die alone? I accept the member's point, and that's why we did issue the, the regional guidance. Um, I don't recognise the situation where no one should be out of dying family members. And if it is happening, I hope the member will give that detail to me because it's not something that we recognise. The guidance says that there should be one family member allowed to be, allowed to be present. And it is up to the, the ward manager or the nurse in charge or the manager of the care home to make sure that that happens in a safe way. So I'll certainly look into that specific, that specific case that we're looking at. Call Dolores Kelly. I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, Minister, and you're quite right to, um, to try to enable as many people as possible to say their goodbyes, but you also have a duty to the staff to ensure that they're not um, suffering uh, verbal abuse as a consequence of g given bad news in, in more than one sense. So I just wonder in terms of how, um, what measures are being put in place to protect staff as well around the decision-making process? Um, and I think the member, her point, her point is actually very valid because it has actually been raised with me from members of the trade union side in regards to even how they are being portrayed uh, as, being, as being callous in this situation where it is guidance that has been developed by, by health professionals. It's recognised across a number of jurisdictions. Um, and it is being done to ensure that the, visiting, uh, the visitors, the carers and the hospital staff are kept as safe as possible, which is in very trying times. This isn't something that we want to do. It's not something that my, my chief nurse or her advisory team wants to do. It's not something certainly that the staff in those settings want to do, because it does place an increased burden on them uh, as well. But what I will say that, you know, the, the, the end of life care that the staff across all health settings have, have given, and I've heard many testimonies, and I'm sure the member has, is that we ensure you know, nobody dies alone because the dedication of our health care system and the professionals within it ensure that doesn't happen. I call Alan Chambers. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answers thus far, uh, and I recognise that this is, will have been a difficult issue to consider for his department. Can I confirm that any decision on visiting policy is especially informed by the opinions of his chief professional officers? As well as the clinicians and frontline workers in our hospitals, and I, I can give give the member that reassurance, as I think that reassurance was given to to the health committee. But what I will say as well, they do give that reassurance 
in the professional nature that they come as well, but I also know of the human input that they do as well, about the caring side is that they put into this decision-making process. Because as I've said, it's not an easy one, but it is one that's there to ensure the safety of those visiting, but also those who have to facilitate the visiting as well. I call Jim Allister. Uh, Minister's attention to not just the end-of-life situation, but uh, when newborns arrive, surely the present restrictions are far too severe in respect of fathers who are admitted for the birth, who pass through all the COVID protections, and then are summarily shown the door effectively and not allowed to see the newborn or the mother until they are released from hospital. Surely there needs to be more flexibility about that. Um, and again, the member raises that point. It's not an easy one, and the member will know that. But the guidance is based on the best scientific advice available at any given stage. Northern Ireland is currently at surge level four when it comes to our visiting regulations, which states that in maternity settings, birth partners will be facilitated to accompany the pregnant woman to the dating scan, early pregnancy clinic, anomaly scans, fetal medical department, uh, when admitted to an individual room for active labour and birth, and to visit in antenatal and postnatal wards for up to one hour each week. That decision is to permit visitors into a facility on a day-to-day -day basis uh, will still lie with the nurses in charge and be based on a risk assessment and the ability to ensure social distancing and the safety of both patients and visitors. This is not the experience I would hope for expectant mothers, and I recognise that it is a very anxious time for all families. And many difficult requests have been and will continue to be made to the public of the public around all aspects of health service provision in order to reduce the spread of infection and to protect expectant mothers, their families and the staff providing that care. Can I advise members that question number six has been withdrawn? And I call Paul Free. Question number two, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Each of the seasonal influenza vaccines used in Northern Ireland provide protection against the three or four influenza viruses which have been identified by the World Health Organization for that year as the virus is most likely to cause significant disease. The vaccine will only provide protection against these viruses and factor, factors such as a person's age and health will affect their response to the vaccine given and therefore will influence the vaccine's effectiveness in preventing flu in that person. Vaccine effectiveness is reported across the UK and is included in each annual national flu report, which can be found online. Vaccine effectiveness can vary between population groups and according to the strain of virus covered by that vaccine, as well as the closeness of the match between the vaccine and the strain of flu. The flu vaccine is the best protection against flu uh, for our population. I call Paul Free for supplement. The Minister for his answer. Can I ask the Minister, given the call went out for everyone to be immunised with regards to the flu jab, is he confident? that the most vulnerable of our society who gets the flu jab on a yearly basis will be able to access it this year? Um, and the member makes a valid point, and I thank him for reiterating it, because we have been clear that the duality of having the flu and COVID-19 at the same time does increase an extreme risk to, to the patients. And again, the, the, the groups who are entitled to the flu, flu vaccine will be contacted by, by their health professionals and well in keeping with the advice. Uh, the eligible population groups for flu vaccination in Northern Ireland are primary school children, anyone who has an increased risk of serious illness from flu due to an underlying medical condition, pregnant women, residents of residential or nursing homes, main carers for an elderly or disabled person, frontline health and social care workers, including those working in care homes and those aged 65 and over. So the, the amount of vaccine uh, that we have acquired has been increased on the normal standardisation of a year. But one of the most important things that we are doing is ask anyone who is eligible uh, for the flu vaccine to come forward and get it, because it, it protects them and it helps us fight COVID-19 at the same time. We call Paula Bradshaw. Oh, um, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, just on that point there, the additional category for those eligible for the flu vaccine now includes those who live with people who received shielding letters. Are you assured that there are enough doses? Um, we are. We have. We have purchased extra doses of, of the flu vaccine. 
and as we expand, um, each category is only expanded to match the availability of the doses that we actually have. So if we have extra capacity, we'll, we will be expanding uh, the eligibility of those groups um, who can actually get it. So I, I am assured by my, my health professionals that there is enough flu vaccine uh, this year to meet the current demands of those who we're asking to come forward. But should we get additional, uh, additional supplies, we will be increasing uh, those people who are, ac who are due to be accessible or can't access the flu vaccine. I call Sinead Bradley. Mr Deputy Speaker, on that, uh, Minister, given that you are confident that there should be enough vaccine, have you had any conversations with pharmacies um, to ask whether they could offer capacity in terms of actually delivering on flu jabs this year? Um, our community pharmacy partners uh, within the, the health service do deliver a flu vaccine for those who want to come forward actually and pay for it, so they have the ability, ability uh, to provide it as well as their GP services. So it is about getting uh, as many people eligible, uh, not just to receive it, but also to give it as well. So there's a large piece of work going across the health and social care system on peer vaccinators so that we can increase that pool of people who can actually give the vaccine and our community pharmacy partners are part of that pool. Moving on, I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question three. Um, I thank the member for her question. The current general policy is that all staff who are symptomatic or isolating at a, as a household member is symptomatic are el eligible for testing in Northern <coughs> Ireland. This includes community-based domiciliary care providers who, as essential health care workers, are currently able to access testing either through the HSC laboratories or via the National Testing Programme. Should there be an indication of more than one symptomatic individual among a group of care workers, an appropriate risk assessment will be undertaken by the public health agency, with testing of all individuals undertaken as deemed appropriate by that risk assessment. The priority groups eligible for testing are kept under constant review by my department's expert advisory group for testing and are updated regularly in line with the, scientifics, with the emerging scientific and uh, medical evidence as the pandemic continues to evolve. The position with regard uh, to the appropriate frequency of testing of domiciliary care workers is kept under active review by that expert group. Thank you again, and thank you, Minister. Minister, I am in contact with um, one of my constituents whose mother does receive domiciliary care um, and has now tested positive and is in acute care um, for, with COVID. Um, but we've also heard informally that some of our domiciliary carers um, attending her, that up to three other carers who have attended the same, who have been in attendance with the same client, have also um, confirmed positive. Uh, and to date, there has still been no formal contact from the care and companies involved, nor from the track and trace system. Does the minister really feel that this is good enough to protect our vulnerable people? And he, can he can commit to ensuring better systems and protections are put in place immediately? In regards to, to the specific that the member raises, I'm concerned when I hear that. It's not something that I would recognise that I want my, my testing system or the test tra trace and protect system to be doing. So again, uh, not wanting to con um, comment on an individual case. If the member does provide me with the, the name and address of her constituency and the care company, I'll definitely make sure it's followed up on, but also that the public health agency is in contact with that company as well, because there is a duty of care there that they should be acting on. So if the member wants to provide me with that information, I'll certainly follow it up for her. I call Colin Gildenew. Goramagat, last King Horlia, and uh, Goramagat to the Minister for his answers today and for the member for her question on this. And given, Minister, how vital uh, healthcare workers are in relation to dealing with the pandemic, what plans do you or your department have to expand the testing to all staff and not just those who are symptomatic? Um, there, there has been a, a large piece of work um, in regards to who el is eligible and when we should be doing that regular testing programme, and the member knows well, well that the um, one of the first cohorts uh, that we have put in place for the, the regular repeat testing is the, our care home staff and care home residents as well, because we have seen through expert advice and guidance and scientific advice and guidance that that is the cohort that needs that regular testing so we can protect um, those residents in those care homes. And when we look even you know, where we are in regards to the number of care homes that are showing positive cases, it is showing that that approach and that procedure has been effective 
in this stage um, of the pandemic to ensure that we're keeping those care home infections as low as possible. The expert advisory group regularly looks at the frequency of who should be tested, when they should be tested, and the, I suppose the positive contribution uh, that that regular testing programme actually delivers uh, for the entirety uh, of our healthcare service, but also how we fight the pandemic. So it's something that's kept under regular review by that group. I call Pam Cameron. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers. Can I ask the Minister if his department is looking at the possibility of pooling testing, such as we heard about in Health Committee recently, an example which came from a professor in Hong Kong? Uh, I'm not sure of pooling or, or pull, multiple testing. I know that was, uh, it was an approach uh, that was actually advanced in Germany at the very beginning of, of, of the pandemic, where they tested 10 people, put it all into one sample, and if that sample tested positive, then they tested the 10. There was, uh, I suppose, queries over the efficiency um, of that process, because those 10 people actually had to wait on the first result coming back before they were called for the second uh, test to be, to, be, to be delivered, and then the result as well. So it actually delayed uh, the result of what one of those 10 people in that sort of pill uh, would actually be identified as been tested positive. So it's not something um, we did at the first pandemic. It's not something I think we're considering doing at this point in time either. Moving on, I call Cahill Boylan. Kesh Deberi. Kahar, let hold question number four, please. Um, again, I thank the member for, for his question. And I recognise that this is a difficult and worrying time, particularly for those who may have an underlying condition, which means they are more clinically vulnerable uh, to the impact of COVID-19. As members will be aware, new restrictions come into force across Northern Ireland from the 22nd of September. These new regulations do not constitute a lockdown, but the overriding goal is to keep household-to-household -household contact as low as possible to help reduce the spread of COVID-19. The need for further specific advice for those who were previously shielding is being kept under continuous review. However, at this point in time, there has been no change to the decision to pause shielding which came into the effect from the 1st of August. I know that some of those who were previously shielding are relieved that there has not been a return to the advice to stay at home at all times, and I recognise for others the pause in shielding has been difficult to navigate and has brought, it with, brought with it new uncertainties, which combined with the rising numbers of COVID-19 cases in the community has led to a sense of increased anxiety. There is no easy route through the current difficulties that we all face, but I believe that it is important that we continue to seek to achieve as balanced an approach as possible. And there's always a degree of risk and contact with the outside world, but remaining indoors indefinitely is also detrimental to physical and mental health. And I would therefore encourage clinically vulnerable and older people to be particularly careful in following the advice on limiting household contacts, social distancing, hand washing, and wearing a face covering. However, I'd also ask everyone in our community to play their part in keeping each other safe at this difficult time, it remains more important than ever that we stick together, stringently follow the public health advice, and adhere to the new regulations. I call Cahill Boylan. I would ask you to could I thank you and thank the Minister for his answer. The Minister is well aware that there have been thousands of people had a shield. They are concerned now with the rise in the number of the positive cases. But could I put it to the Minister, what reassurance can he give those people who have had the shield and possibly may have to shield again? And if they do, what supports can he put in place for those people? Um, and again, the member makes a, a very valid point. It was a, a piece of work that was actually commissioned and carried out by the Place and Client Council, who actually engaged with that first cohort who had to shield and their experiences. And that's where that part of my answer comes from. There are those within that cohort who don't want to shield again. And there's, that, there's a cohort with it in that group as well who want to shield again. So that's where, at this point in time, uh, we are looking at a further risk ma matrix. Should we have to go into the second piece of guidance about who should sh shield, that it will be a much smaller cohort for very specific uh, medical reasons, uh, and that will be supported by the guidance of CMOs from across the four nations. In regards to the support mechanisms, when we do ask someone to shield, I think it's important that we have the, su the, the, the support, not just of the community, uh, which has been invaluable, uh, and the first cohort of shielding should it be from their local community groups, GAA, Orange Lodges, you know, that first cohort who shielded were well looked after by their communities to ensure that we have the ability for those groups 
to do it again. And I have been in contact with, with the members minister in the Department of Communities to ensure that that support uh, will be financially and physically supported as well, because that's crucial that we provide an infrastructure to support those people if we do ask people to shield for a second time. I call Paul Given. Minister, elaborate on what criteria will be used in triggering letters being sent on guidance, and is that the same criteria that was used in the first instance? And can he assure us that the support package will be in place before the measures are taken? You know, and, and I think on, on following on from, from the answer that I've already given, the, CM, the four CMOs are currently looking um, at a risk ma matrix which will assess uh, what we've learned from the first cohort and specifically in regards to what medical conditions and underlying medical conditions were more vulnerable for the worst effects of COVID-19 because what we have seen coming into to this period and from the learnings in the first part is there were a number of groups of medical conditions that were asked to shield that were not adversely affected by COVID. So it's about keeping as many people not shielded as is physically possible. But in regards to the support mechanisms, the members vitally correct. You know, when we ask someone to shield, if that's something that we're doing centrally as a government, as an executive, we also have to make sure that those support mechanisms are, are, are there as well. And as I say, that's why I've been engaged with the, the Department of Communities, but also the Department of Finance to make sure it's a holistic package, but also the vital work that our, even our community pharmacy um, supplied during that first period of shielding, where they actually set up a, a delivery mechanism for, for those who needed prescriptions as well, and that used a lot of, of community volunteers to deliver that as well. So it's about making sure that all support mechanisms are in place before we take that second step. I call Cara Hunter. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, and I thank the Minister for his answers so far. Um, can I ask the Minister how he plans to support the most vulnerable in our society who may be shielding uh, and struggling with mental illness if they are based in rural communities uh, and do not have access to the internet when seeking support? Thank you. Um, and you know, I, I thank the Member for her question. I know it's an issue that she has, she has raised uh, she has raised before in regards to the mental health challenges that do present when we ask people to shield in again. And the engagement um, that I had with community pharmacy when they delivered, you know, and looked at the working with uh, delivering prescriptions, uh, one of the things that their volunteers was actually saying was it wasn't the time to deliver the prescription that was the most vital. It was about the engagement on the door where they actually had had face-to-face -face interaction. And I think that's one of the challenges that we need, and as I say, you know, just to correct the member, there's no one shielding at, at the minute. We haven't advised anybody to do that, but it's to make sure that there is community support with engagement, with talking to people, you know, the work that um, rural support does as well within our, our rural communities. Um, the good morning telephone lines, you know, good morning Ballymena, Ballycastle, they operate across across Northern Ireland, but also that additional support, as I said, when I, when I was answering the previous member's um, question, it's about that community cohesion where we look to community organisations, Orange Lodges, GAA, who really stepped up and engaged to make sure there was nobody left alone, because I think that is one of, one of the largest challenges, that we can't allow anybody to feel abandoned. And again, that came out of the, the research that we did through the Patient Client Council with that, in, in that initial shielding group that talking to somebody was vitally important and it's something that we need to make sure that if when we ask somebody to shield again that there also is those support mechanisms that they have they have a voice at the other end of the phone or the other side of the door as well. So there's there's someone there to support them. I call Trevor Lum. Thank you much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question number five, Minister. Um, as a consequence of the need to prioritise the response to the coronavirus pandemic over the past few months. Work on a range of projects, including the reshaping stroke care, has been paused. While I believe that this was the right thing to do, I appreciate the wider impact this will have had on stroke patients across Northern Ireland. I can assure you that reshaping stroke care remains a key priority, and I recognise the urgent need for the reform of stroke services in Northern Ireland. Over 19,000 people responded to the consultation on reshaping stroke care, and my officials have completed an analysis of responses. I have asked for some further analysis to be undertaken regarding the staff re staffing requirements um, for the hyper-acute stroke network proposed in the consultation, and this work is currently underway. I intend to consider this analysis alongside the consultation analysis and evidence base for reform in reaching my decision, and I will update the House accordingly. Call Trevor Lund for supplementary. 
uh, th thank the Minister for his uh, answer so far. Um, he has referred to the increasing pressures caused by the resurgence of COVID-19. And indeed, there's some dreadful news coming from across the border today about, about what's happening there, which may spill over into our jurisdiction as well. But can he, can he give us an assurance that the uh, stroke service realignment will not be unduly uh, set aside as a result of the pressure to COVID-19, given the importance of it? And I thank the member for his follow-up question. I can assure him that it won't be set aside, but I can also assure him that it won't be rushed, because I think this is a, a once-in-a-generational decision to change how we support um, those who've had a stroke and those who, who need that aftercare once they've had a stroke. So I'll take that in, in due time and in due process, making sure that I take into consideration the responses um, and the additional information that I've sought from my department, but also the responses from the consultation as well. I call Gemma Dolan. And I thank the Minister for his answers. Um, Minister, you've just referred to um, the fact that you've asked for further analysis to be undertaken around staff and within the reshaping of stroke care. Um, can you clarify what issues this further analysis is examining and what is the time frame for completion? I, I thank the member, you know, as I said in, in my answer there just recently, you know, this is a once in a generational chance to improve, improve stroke services and deliver improvements and outcomes and it's for that reason that I'm not prepared to rush into a decision uh, without access to all the information. I believe that information is needed to make the right decision and I make no apology for seeking some further analysis on the options outlined because it will depend on where um, the, the stroke services are delivered and at what level they are delivered across Northern Ireland that will have a, an impact on staff. I need to make sure if we make any change into regards to what that stroke, future stroke service may look like that we actually have the staff to deliver it as well. There's no point in coming out with recommendations if we don't have the ability that I actually can deliver the work that we need it to be doing on the ground. I call Joanne Bonney. Speaker, um, the Minister knows well that with regard to stroke care, time is of the essence. So on that basis, will he confirm that service, stroke services in the Ulster Hospital are being protected for people in the east of the province, including East Belfast, North Down, Ards and Cumber, for whom the extra distance further into the other side of Belfast could prove very detrimental to their prognosis? And, and again, as I've said, no decision has been made as of yet for the locations uh, where our stroke services will, will be reconfigured should they, they need to be reconfigured. But what I will say in regards to um, to the work that has been undertaken. Uh, the SNAP audit, which is uh, an assessment of the delivery of stroke services, which actually happened between January and March of this year, um, three of those stroke units in Northern Ireland actually achieved an A grade and four received a B grade. And that's a significant improvement um, over the last six months when only two stroke units achieved an A grade and two uh, received a B grade. So the delivery of care that is currently there is of a very high standard and that's been accredited and uh, assessed by that, that SNAP audit as well. So the provision that we currently have is fit for purpose and is supporting our patients and the review, as I said, will be done in the time that it takes for me to come to the right decision that ensures the future proofing of our stroke service in Northern Ireland. I call William Humphrey. Question number seven. Um, I, I thank the member for his question. It is accepted that the COVID-19 pandemic in particular, uh, lockdown and other re restrictions, will have a negative impact on our population's mental well-being. At the start of the pandemic, I put arrangements in place to mitigate and address this impact. And when I published the Mental Health Action Plan on the 19th of May, I included, included a dedicated COVID-19 mental health response plan. This plan set out the, the mental health response to the pandemic and outlined specific actions. Those actions included public health messaging to support people to look after their mental well-being while staying at home and the provision of updated mental health support and advice on the mind, mindingyourhead.info website. It included the development of an online app library to help and support health, help, self-help. It included the rollout of psychological first aid training to staff and volunteers on the front line. It provided a provision of free stress control classes online, which have been available since May and will continue to be available until the end of the year. 
It also included bereavement guidance and a workforce wellbeing framework and dedicated psychological helplines for frontline staff. This support remains in place as we continue to battle COVID-19 and the impact of the pandemic on our community's mental health. A key element of responding to the emerging mental health need is the implementation of the Mental Health Action Plan, which includes the development of a new mental health strategy. This, this gives us an opportunity to build on our mental health response to the pandemic and build that into a 10-year strategic plan with a substantial evidence base. We can re reinvigorate and reorganise services to better reflect the new and emerging profile of need and we can build on innovative solutions that have come to the fore during this period. And that is the end of our time for listed questions, and we now move on to topical questions. And I call Artina Anderson. Uh, Minister, could you give us an assessment of the barriers to North-South cooperation that has been revealed by the COVID-19 response? Um, I, I, th I thank the member for, for her question in regards to, to barriers. There's none that I, none that spring to mind apart from um, the challenges of communication at times, and that has come about by political decisions making either on either side of the border. We have had challenges in regards to the transfer of information on travel locator forms, uh, which is currently receiving legal advice. Um, the party, or sorry, the members, uh, junior minister uh, Declan Kearney, and myself attended the north-south ministerial uh, council meeting on health format um, on Friday, and a number of those issues um, were addressed. But what I can assure the member, there is no deliberate or barrier uh, to the sharing of information or how we respond to COVID-19. There are technical and legal difficulties which we are both working to on both sides of this border to address as soon as, as, as we possibly and practically can. I call Martina Anderson for supplementary. Minister, uh, I know you're aware that there was a memorandum of understanding signed, and we also know that it's not operable. We know that Ireland is a single epidemiological unit, and we know the spread of COVID-19, particularly in Derry and Strabane today, 804 cases over the last seven days. So, Minister, I believe, do you, or would you not concur, that there is a need for primary legislation to try to address these issues? Um. And again, I, I, I don't recognise the member's statement in, the, in regards to the memor, memorandum of understanding uh, not being operable. I, I think it does work. I think we've had, challenge, we've had challenges to it, which we are addressing on either side of the border. They're not, they're not political, they're not personal. They are operational in regards to legislation and sharing of, of personal data, and that's coming from the AGs. That's been worked on at this, this minute in time. So in regards to primary legislation, it would need to and coherent and um, legislation on both sides of the border at the same time. I don't think we're there yet. I don't think we need it because we have good working relationships between myself and the Health Minister in the Republic of Ireland, or CMOs, and also our public health agencies, which I think we can build on, which I think we can approve, but I don't think legislation is, is the answer to what we need to be doing. Patsy McLone is not in this place. I call Claire Bailey. Speaker, I noticed with some amusement the statement from the department last week warning women not to take abortion pills at home. Now we know that earlier medical abortion pathways were put in place by trusts back in April of this year to facilitate women. So following the announcement on Friday from the Northern Trust that they can no longer sustain this voluntary service, what advice does the minister give to women in his own constituency to assist them accessing these services? Um, and to be clear to the member, my department has not given instructions uh, to the Health and Social Care Board uh, to commission abortion services. However, abortion is now legal and can be carried out by registered medical professionals. Um, I will not comment on the locations within trusts where abortions have been carried out. And the member will be aware I have sought executive agreement on the establishment of an emergency early medical abortion service to ensure that women's health needs are addressed during this pandemic. I call Claire Bailey for supplement. Thank you. Well, we know the abortion regulations were laid before Parliament um, and came into force in March. They provided, as you say, the new legal basis for medical professionals in Northern Ireland to terminate pregnancies lawfully. Can the Minister then tell this House what other lawful medical services his department have refused to provide funding or resource for? 
Um, so I, and the members, I think the members supplementary is, um, has been deliberately uh, ob obtuse in that because the abortion regulations um, in 2002 came into force on the 31st of March. They set out the circumstances in which an abortion may take place and establish a requirement for terminations to be certified by a registered medical professional and notified to the chief medical officer. As terminations are carried out outside any normal commissioning arrangements, there is currently no agreed proto protocol for processing notifications of terminations. They contain sensitive personal information and to date have been counted, uh, but otherwise unprocessed. Um, and the member is aware of that and the services that can be provided and are provided across a number of other trusts in Northern Ireland. I call Tom Buchanan. Minister, having again witnessed the outrageous and blatant breach of the COVID regulations at the GE match in Balahi over the weekend, where there was no adherence to social distancing, no respect or regard for the regulations which were treated with utter contempt, what concerns do you have for the aftermath of this in seeking to control the increase of the virus? The member um, raises concerns which I think have been widely publicised, and th those uh, pictures, those images were brought to my attention over the weekend. Um, I was disappointed to see it. I was angry to see it, because if there's one person in that group or community who has uh, COVID-19, there, there is all chance that it is now spread among that group. But it's not just solely restricted to that group that we saw at the GAA match. It's the same as any group that we see uh, portrayed on social media, should it be in a bar setting where um, social distancing isn't being observed, should it be in a university hostel where that uh, social distancing has not been observed. So in regards to, to what we witnessed uh, and what the member refers to, I'm disappointed, I'm angry, but I also note now that the GAA has suspended all games uh, for forthcoming, and they've also expressed uh, a disappointment of what they're classifying as, I think, is it after, after pitch or after game um, actions as well, which I think you know, they are claiming are, are beyond their control, but I would have liked to have seen more strengthened applications to the guidance that was already in place. I call Tom Buchanan for supplementary. Thank you, and thank the Minister for his response. But, Minister, this is not the first such incident that, uh, like this that we have witnessed. Indeed, only two weeks ago, my colleague Keith Buchanan raised a similar incident with you uh, in this House. Um, and would you not agree that while the GAA have now put some sanctions in place, this is a sort of a matter of closing the door when the horse is bolted? And obviously, that uh, these people, the players and the supporters, that they may well be guilty of passing on this virus to some vulnerable people within our society. Can member come to who, question? As a result, will lose their lives. And, and I think the member said, you know, when we put regulations and guidance in place, it's there for a reason, and it's there to prevent the unnecessary spread um, of COVID-19. So, as I say, when I saw um, the examples that were on demonstration and shared widely on social media over the weekend and in other situations as well. It concerns me because at some stage the member is right, but more often than like there's going to be someone within that crowd ends up within our hospital setting as well, which puts pressure on our hospital services, on our nurses, on our doctors as well. So there has to be some recognition that our regulations, our guidance uh, is put in place to prevent hospitalisations, to prevent people in, in during ICUs, to prevent death as well. So it's, it's a clear message, and it comes from the executive. It comes from the executive jointly. Uh, our guidance is there for a reason. If there is breaches uh, to those rules and regulations that are in place, I would encourage the PSNI to investigate all media and all social media that is currently available, no matter the situation or the scenario, because of a tax enforcement to get the message through to that small, small minority of people who think they're either above these regulations or immune to COVID-19. I think that's the point that we're now at, unfortunately, and that's why I welcome the establishment of the compliance and enforcement group within the executive and support the work that it's doing. I call John O'Dowd. Mr. Can you advise the House as to whether uh, the serious adverse incident investigation into Craigavon Hospital and Daisy Hill Hospitals COVID outbreaks has, has begun? Um, I don't have the specific um, update 
to, to hand for the member, but I'll get back to him. I do know the panel has been appointed for, for the place uh, and for the, the SAI that, that's currently undergoing at level three. I have given assurances to the, the team that is doing it, but also reassurances to the families. Uh, I've met one of the families that the panel will have the ability to set up its own terms of reference with input from the families as well, and there will be no restriction of either access to information or access to whatever needs to be done um, by the panel once it is, it is commissioned and up and running. Call John O'Dowd. Thank, thank you for that information thus far, Minister. Minister, since the start of September, there has been 22 hospital deaths reported. And I hate going into statistics, but this is important. 22 hospital deaths reported. 12 of those have been associated with the outbreak in Daisy Hill uh, and Craigavon. That's 54% of all recorded hospital deaths are, are associated with those outbreaks. Surely, Minister, those investigations should be ongoing, and the findings used to protect hospital staff, patients, and visitors moving forward. And the member, and I think it's, it's a point the member him, himself has made various times, that we don't wait on the outcomes of the SAI, but the learnings um, of what actually um, happened in, in, the, in the Southern Trust is ongoing. It's live, and that's why I welcome the input from the PHE, the Public Health England, as well, and to the advice and guidance they, they gave so that not just the Southern Trust learned from their experience of outbreaks across hospitals in England and Wales, but that could be shared across all our trusts here in Northern Ireland so that we don't witness the terrible um, loss of life that we've seen both in Craig, uh, Craig Avon Area Hospital and Daisy Hill. I call Steve Aiken. And thank you very much indeed. And uh, may I ask the Minister if he could provide an update on the COVID proximity app and how many exposure notifications have been issued? I thank the member for, for his question um, and the update on, on the COVID app itself. On, at the end of last week, we actually launched uh, the app, which is now available for those um, under 18s. Um, to date, we've a download, we've, it has been downloaded over 4, 000, or, sorry, 411,000 times. Um, it has sent out 8,500 text messages. And app, app users have received positive uh, messages from uploading the diagnosis key of nearly 2,000 times. But app, app users have received exposure notifications and informed to self-isolate. Uh, 5,722 people have received those notifications. So it shows that, that our app has been beneficial uh, in contacting those people who may not actually have known that they were in contact with somebody who later tested uh, positive for COVID. I call Steve Aiken for something. And, um, thank you very much indeed for the, uh, the Minister's answer so far. Could I just ask him how the operability of the app is working on both sides of the border? And, and again, I thank the member uh, for, for his question. As he'll know and as the, as the House knows, um, our app was the first that was able to, to operate cross-border in two different jurisdictions. Um, and it was discussed at the North South Ministerial Council meeting on, on Friday as well in regards to, to how well it was working. Um, to date, um, we have received from the, the Republic of Ireland uh, anonymous keys relating to 1,471 cases, and our app has sent to the Republic of Ireland anonymously um, 1,355 cases. So therefore, again, there's 2,700 people have been identified uh, on either side of the border because of the interoperability of the app that we produced in conjunction with the Republic of Ireland. I call Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, could I ask the Minister if he could tell us, in his view, whose responsibility it is to um, enforce the wearing of face coverings in the retail sector? Um, the Member will know that this is, this is quite a contentious um, issue in regards to who is actually enforceable uh, or who should be enforceable. In my opinion, this rule is actually set down in regulation, so it is up to the PSNI to deliver that responsibly and ultimately. But I would encourage all retail uh, providers, all shop owners, to actively encourage people to wear it. I knew, do know there is a, is a more um, proactive approach now, as we've seen some additional restrictions put in place in the North West, I've seen some of our major supermarkets actually taking a more proactive approach to encouraging people to wearing face coverings in the retail sector, uh, and also in regards to uh, 
those men, bus drivers, train drivers, conductors, encouraging people in public transport uh, to use it as well. I do think there's a piece of work that the executive needs to engage with about the use of face coverings and the benefit that they actually do provide, especially as we are seeing now an increased transmission of COVID-19 in Northern Ireland. And that is the end of our period of time to questions for the Minister of Health. I would ask members to take their ease for a few moments uh, before the urgent oral question to the Minister for the Economy.